Bismillah, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullah. You're listening to Microbiology Lesson on Introduction to Immunology. The learning outcomes for this topic are firstly, for you to be able to identify components of the immune system and then cells of the immune system. And secondly, to describe general features of both the innate and adaptive immune system. For this part one, we're going to look at two things the components of the immune system and the cells of the immune system. Now, if someone were to ask you which one is the immune system, you know, where is it? Well, it's hard to point a finger to specific organs or areas in our body because the immune system involves multiple organs, or, or I would say at least the majority of the organs in our body. And you can pick one of those organs and do a whole PhD about the immunity of that particular organ. Like mine was on respiratory immunology, the lungs. Yet, even after I finished th that PhD, I still can't claim I know everything about the immune system of the lungs. Because there's so much depth and layers of it. And that's just one organ. So imagine the, Im the immune system is the whole set of organs and tissues and cells. They all work together to defend the body against harmful pathogens, cells and substances. Let's talk about the components of the immune system first. I'll give you three for this course. The cardiovascular system, the mononuclear phagocyte system and the lymphatic system. The first is the cardiovascular. It's the system associated with your heart and blood circulation. Now, in many university textbooks, you might not see a cardiovascular system being discussed as a component of the immune system. There might even be lecturers who might disagree that I put this as part of the, of the immune system. Uh, that's fine. But for me personally, from my reading of recent literature, they are very much intertwined. And, and one example is the role of what's called cardiac mast cells. So this is a type of cells in your heart. Um, I'll leave you the link to a paper about it. One of the ideas in the paper is how cardiac mast cells play a role in both cardiovascular and immunological events. So for example, the cells release VGFC which is a growth factor. It protects against infarctions, against heart attacks. And in that sense, it's cardiovascular. At other times, the cells can also release cytokines like TNF-alpha, which protects us against microbial infection. And that's immunological. So that's just one example of how our cardiovascular system and immune system are closely operated. The second component is the mononuclear phagocyte system. I'll leave you another link for this one if you're interested in understanding the system properly. But the basic concept is this. In our body, we have connective tissues. There are gaps between the cells in these connective tissues. And in those gaps, there are networks of reticular fibers or reticulin. Think of, think of a fishing net the one that fishermen use to catch fish. So imagine a mesh structure like that in between cells. This net is made up of protein fibers called reticular fibers. On this net, there are phagocytes. We'll learn more about phagocytes in a minute. Right now, think of phagocytes as cells that can attack pathogens. Macrophage especially is an example, but other cells as well. So phagocytes are spread out on this net on this reticular fiber network. What are they doing there? They are strategically placed. Think of them like soldiers on a castle wall, like sentinels. So if you play a lot of computer games, computer war games especially, you, you would probably know what a sentinel is. But even if you don't, you can imagine a medieval castle wall and you have soldiers stationed on it these soldiers don't move out of the castle wall to chase after the enemy. They just stay there on guard. But when an enemy comes close to the wall, they will attack the enemy. So phagocytes on this reticular fiber network are sentinels like that. 
They stay there on guard, ready to attack pathogens when the pathogens come close to them. Now, that whole system, the whole thing with reticular fiber and the phagocytes that are distributed on that network, that's what we call mononuclear phagocyte system. So the mononuclear phagocyte system consists of a network of reticular fiber and phagocytes on them. The third component of our immune system is the lymphatic system. Our lymphatic system works very closely with our cardiovascular system. So in our cardiovascular system, we have our heart in the center. The heart pumps blood containing nutrients and, and cells. This blood fluid travels to our pulmonary system, our lungs. Over there, they exchange gases. And then the fluid flows to our blood capillaries. These blood capillaries go around our tissues and the blood capillaries release the fluid containing nutrients into the tissues. Most of this fluid will go back into the capillaries, so like 80-85% of it, but not all. Around 15% of this fluid will be absorbed by another types of capillaries called lymph capillaries. So here it enters the lymphatic system. The lymphatic capillaries are connected to lymphatic vessels and then those vessels are connected to lymph nodes and, and lymphoid organs. Think of the lymphatic system like a military road network. The cardiovascular system is the normal civilian road network, but the lymphatic system, they are the military road network. So on this military road network, when you drive your vehicle, you're going to go through checkpoints. The soldiers are going to check you to make sure you're not a threat. So similarly, in this lymphatic system, when the fluid travels in there, it's going to go through checkpoints. The immune cells are going to check that fluid to make sure it doesn't contain a threat. So in our body, we have hundreds of these lymph nodes, if not thousands of them. So think of them as checkpoints, as small military outposts. And you can find your soldiers, your immune cells in those outposts. One category of those immune cells is called leukocytes. Leukocytes are also known as white blood cells. They are called that to differentiate them from the red blood cells or erythrocytes, which do not directly engage in attacking pathogens. We'll talk more about leukocytes in the next subtopic. For now, just remember that even though you can find leukocytes in our cardiovascular system, our bloodstream, actually you can find more of them in the lymphatic system, especially if you are close to the lymph nodes. Now, other than lymph nodes, our body also has lymphoid nodules. Think of lymphoid nodules as a larger military outpost. So they are they are generally larger than lymph nodes and, and, and more encapsulated often. And then you have your lymphoid organs. Lymphoid organs are your massive military bases. Examples of lymphoid organs are adenoids, tonsils, thymus, spleen, and bone marrow. These lymphoid organs can be divided into two, the primary lymphoid organs and the secondary lymphoid organs. You need to memorize this, but it's so easy to memorize because all you need is to remember the two primary lymphoid organs. Once you remember that, if you come across other lymphoid organs in the literature, you automatically assume they are secondary lymphoid organs. So the primary lymphoid organs are the bone marrow and the thymus. So why do immunologists make a distinction between the two, between the primary and secondary lymphoid organs? because they observe different maturation events in those two types of organs, events related to immune cells. In primary lymphoid organs, the immune cells are produced. So these primaries are the military bases where your soldiers are born and raised. This raising of the immune cells is called naive maturation. And that is different than what happens in the, the secondary lymphoid organs where the immune cells undergo antigen-driven maturation. So what's the difference? In naive maturation, the immune cells develop in the absence of antigen. 
antigens, if you remember, are molecules on pathogens. Immune cells recognize pathogens by recognizing their antigens. So again, in naive maturation, the immune cells develop in the absence of antigen. After that, the naive cells go to the secondary lymphoid organs. In the secondary lymphoid organs, the cells undergo antigen-driven maturation. What happens here is the immune cells encounter antigens and bind with antigens. So that binding with antigens help differentiate the immune cells into a, a fully activated immune cells. An analogical way of thinking about it is uh, naive mature cells are naive soldiers who have never seen the enemy, while antigen-driven mature cells are soldiers who have seen the enemy. They are fully activated. So that antigen-driven maturation happens in the lymph nodes. The lymph will enter the lymph nodes through their afferent vessels. By the way, the fluid in the lymphatic system, we call it lymph. So the lymph enters a node through afferent vessels. So that's A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. In the end, it will exit the node through afferent vessels, and that's E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. So they are spelled the same, except for the first letter. The fluid enters the lymph nodes from the one with A, for alpha, afferent. And it exits through E, for echo, afferent. It enters from the afferent and exits through the afferent. I know they sound similar, but you'll get the difference. They're common words in medicine. You'll find them in other contexts. But in this context, in the lymph nodes, once the lymph fluid enters the lymph nodes, it goes through certain sinuses or passages. The lymph goes through subcapsular sinus, then trabecular sinus, and then medullary sinus. For now, don't worry about what happens in those individual sinuses. Just remember that, generally, when the lymph fluid enters the node, the fluid is arriving at a checkpoint. And there, the fluid will meet the resident immune cells, the naive cells I mentioned before. During this meeting, an event called antigen presentation can happen. We'll learn more about antigen presentation in the next episode, I think, or maybe the one after that. But the point here is, if the fluid contains antigen, it will activate the resident immune cells, the immune cells inside the lymph nodes. And that leads to antigen-driven maturation of the immune cells. Okay, we went through the components of the immune system. Now let's discuss the cells of the system. I mentioned leukocytes earlier. Now I want you to differentiate leukocytes from platelets. The main difference is that leukocytes have nuclei and the platelets don't. Functionally, they work together. Leukocytes are involved in phagocytosis, inflammation, and some members of them are vital in adaptive immune response. Platelets are important in inflammation and blood clotting. Okay, we now know the difference between platelets and leukocytes. Actually, I did mention erythrocytes too earlier. So you know three categories by now. The erythrocytes or red blood cells. You know the platelets who don't have nuclei. And you know the leukocytes. All right. The next point I want you to learn is that all these different types of cells, they all come from the same progenitor, the same ancestor. Before they differentiate into erythrocytes, platelets and leukocytes, they were all once the same type of cells, called pluripotent stem cells. This is one of the most powerful concepts in immunology. Why? Because of the possibility to customize the types of immune cells to help patients. We can start from the stem cells and program them to differentiate intentionally, especially with CRISPR becoming more accessible. So for example, we can try programming the immune cells to accept transplant organs or we can reboot the immune system altogether to help patients with autoimmune diseases. Okay, so that's one point. The other point is, among the leukocytes, 
you can subcategorize them into different types of cells. One way of categorizing leukocytes is separating the granulocytes and agranulocytes. So basically those who have granules, granulocytes, and those who don't have granules, agranulocytes. Under granulocytes, you have dendritic cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Under agranulocytes, you have monocytes and lymphocytes. Take a look at our reference textbook, or anyway online really, the info is so easy to find. Uh, get to know each of these cells, uh, see how they look like, and see what they do, what else? Uh, and what they turn into when they differentiate. For example, monocytes will differentiate into macrophages. Macrophages are of two types at least. One is roaming macrophages. The other is fixed macrophages. Their names kind of explain them already. The roaming or wandering macrophages, they travel around in our cardiovascular system and lymphatic system, often in their monocyte form. On the other hand, the fixed macrophages, they stay in one place. They stay in certain types of tissues. There, we name the macrophages based on where they are stationed. If they are in the lungs, we call them alveolar macrophages. Pretty straightforward, easy to remember, because we've got alveolus in our lungs. But in the bone, it's called osteoclast, because the word comes from Greek, I think. So it's not as straightforward to memorize, at least not to me. So study these different names, and especially the ones before this, the neutrophils, lymphocytes, those ones, make make drawings, make mind maps, whatever you need to do, because it will come up later. It will help you understand future episodes. Okay? All right, I'll stop there. See you in the next one. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.